Now let's talk about another condition affecting the liver uh, called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And so first, I want to break down this word so we know exactly what's going on. We've talked about trypsin before in the pancreas lecture, and trypsin is a type of protease that we saw. And here from our pancreatic enzyme lecture, you can see that trypsin was useful for protein digestion. So if trypsin is a protease, it should stand to reason that an antitrypsin would be an antiprotease. And so in our body, there exists this balance between proteases and antiproteases. You don't want too many proteases in your body because they could actually overwhelm your defense system and start damaging your own tissue. And so alpha-1 antitrypsin is a type of antiprotease. And the condition we're going to talk about, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, is where we have a deficiency in these antiproteases. And what we'll find, especially in the lungs, that most of the clinical sequelae of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency arises from this influx, this uh, relative increase of proteases that ends up damaging our own tissues. So the pathogenesis is a little bit different depending on which organ you're talking about. So it's going to cause damage to both the liver and the lungs. So in the liver, what happens is that that alpha-1 antitrypsin protein is normally synthesized in our liver. In alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, what happens is that that protein that's supposed to be synthesized nicely and packaged and sent out it's misfolded. And because it gets misfolded, that alpha-1 uh, antitrypsin protein starts to accumulate in your hepatocyte. It first accumulates in your endoplasmic reticulum, and then it starts to accumulate. Your body tries to package it into different organelles. But ultimately, what's going to happen is all that misfolded alpha-1 antitrypsin protein will overwhelm your hepatocytes and start to cause liver damage and cirrhosis. So again, if this is just a hepatocyte, and that's our endoplasmic reticulum, normally we can produce these AAT proteins, and those can get secreted into the bloodstream and everybody's happy. In, in AAT alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, however, we're going to have misfolding of that protein. And so it'll accumulate in your endoplasmic reticulum first, and ultimately it'll start accumulating throughout your uh, liver cells and this can cause liver damage and eventually cirrhosis. In the lungs, it has a little bit different mechanism. So in the lungs, what's always happening is that you have this balance between proteases and antiproteases. So you need proteases in some cases because they'll help kill off pathogens and other materials. But normally, if the proteases get to a region of the lung that they don't belong, you usually have antiproteases like alpha-1 antitrypsin that can help degrade those lung proteases and keep everything in order. As you might expect, if you have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, these proteases can now overwhelm the lungs and cause significant lung damage, specifically referred to as pan acinar emphysema. And I want to talk about what pan acinar emphysema means versus sentry acinar emphysema. So pan acinar means, and pan always means everything. So like Pangaea was when all the continents were in, in one specific area, right? So pan acinar means it's affecting the entire acinus. And you'll see this in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and it'll be most uh, most notable in the lower lobes of the lungs. Let's contrast this with sentry acinar emphysema, which is where the inflammation only affects the proximal portion of the acinus and not the distal portion. This type of emphysema is related to smoking exposure, and it most often occurs in the upper lobes. So what I want to do now is I want to draw out these differences so you don't forget it in the future. So we have our trachea and our lungs here. And if I take a zoomed in version of our lungs more distally, you're gonna have your terminal bronchioles 
and those will further uh, form into respiratory bronchioles and the respiratory bronchioles are attached directly to our alveoli. And remember from before, I talked about the alveoli a little bit in when I talked about ARDS and the pancreas, I just mentioned that these alveoli are the grape-like sacs that uh, communicate directly with our pulmonary capillaries. So this is where you actually get that gas exchange between uh, O2 and CO2. And to clarify where the asinus is in this picture, the asinus is defined as the alveoli and the respiratory bronchioles. So in this case, our asinus is this entire region here. So in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you're going to get a panacinar emphysema across the entire asinus. And that's because these proteases have nothing to counter-regulate them. There's no alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is an antiprotease. There's nothing to stop them from going wherever they want and causing damage. And for that reason, you're going to see inflammation and damage across the entire asinus. Let's contrast that with sentry acinar emphysema, which only affects the proximal acinus. The reason this happens is that when you smoke, the carcinogens are small, but not small enough. So they, they're, they, they're small enough to enter your terminal bronchial. They're small enough even to make it to some parts of your respiratory bronchioles. But at some point, the, the lumen becomes too small. And so the, most of the damage you're going to find it's going to be in the proximal portion of our asinus here. And the reason why in smoking, you have uh, smoking exposure affecting the upper lobe, it's because when you smoke, as we know, air rises. So once it enters the lungs, that smoke can still rise to the top upper lobes of your lung, and it'll cause this sentry acinar emphysema that we see here. And this will be most predominantly in those upper lobes. So in order to diagnose alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you can do uh, what's called a serum protein genotype analysis. And you can also do a liver biopsy, which shouldn't surprise you because most of our conditions we've seen so far, a lot of times the gold standard is this liver biopsy. I do want to spend a little bit of time on this serum protein genotype analysis because they do test uh, their the inheritance mechanism of alpha-1 antitrypsin because it's a co-dominant disorder. So as I just mentioned, alpha-1 antitrypsin is autosomal co-dominant. And sometimes they'll use this disease to see if you understand the basic genetics associated with it for step one and level one. So just to specify, in our normal autosomal dominant disorders, so in not in co-dominant, let's just say a normal autosomal dominant disorder, one dominant allele will, will change the phenotype. You only need one. The second dominant allele is essentially redundant. However, in autosomal co-dominance, like we see in alpha-1 antitrypsin, each allele will impact the final phenotype. And so, the classic example that I remember learning about in undergrad is if we take flowers and we assume that a big R is will create the phenotype red and a little if you have multiple little R's, you'll create the white phenotype. If we just take this really quick and talk about what happens in autosomal code in autosomal dominant disorders, kind of more of our classic Mendelian genetics, what's going to happen is that as long as you have at least one of these big R's, your phenotype will still be red. You know, it's like I said, this second big R here is redundant to the phenotype. And if you have both little R's, that's the only way, if you have an autosomal recessive, that's the only way your phenotype will actually be the same phenotype that this allele provides. Now, autosomal codominant disorders are a little different in that if you have both big R's, sure, you'll still have this same phenotype but the difference is that because every allele contributes, even this little tiny, this uh, little r will actually contribute to the final phenotype. So you'll get a mixture of red and white. So it might phenotypically look pink. And then finally, if you still have two little r's, you'll get white. The reason why I wanted to mention this framework is that we're going to find out in autosome in AAT, there's going to be a few different phenotypes, and each of them will contribute to the final uh, phenotypic load. 
So there's three alleles that you will have to know for step one and level one. There is our normal allele, our PIM allele, which each PIM allele will contribute 50% to your total uh, necessary alpha-1 antitrypsin production. You also have a PIS allele, which contributes 30%, and a PIZ allele, which only contributes 10%. And this PI is just, um, just so you know, the PI stands for protease inhibitor. Remember that alpha-1 antitrypsin is an antiprotease, which is the same thing as a protease inhibitor. So that's why it says PI. Uh, my mnemonics to remember the M versus the S versus the Z, I think of the M as our mature uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin protein. So this is the one that's working as it should. I remember the S for slight. So it's working in some capacity, but it's not 100% working. And then I remember the Z as, you know, you're, the, it's catching some Zs. This protein's kind of sleeping on the job and only producing you know, 10% of what it needs to. So let's go over the different genotypes because remember, you'll get one of these alleles from your mom and one from your dad. So you can get two of these PIM alleles, so PIMM, which most of us have, and that's when you have your completely normal phenotype. You have 100% of your expected function here. Keep in mind though, that you could actually get a PIM with a PIZ, so you can get a PIMZ uh, genotype, or you can get like this uh, two of these PIS uh, alleles. And in both cases, it'll form about half of the function. And what, how do we get this 60% function? If you take 50% plus 10%, that'll give you a 60% function for this specific genotype. And in this case, if you have two PIS alleles, that'll give you 30 plus 30%. So in both of these cases, you'll get 60% of your function. So you might have some symptoms. It, it's hard to say. It, it's it's very it's uh, quite variable, actually, at this specific genotype. What they will want you to know, especially though, they want you to know that this genotype, the PIZZ, is the worst possible uh, genotype. And it only gives you about 20% of the the function that you should have of alpha-1 antitrypsin. And so these are the people that are most at risk for significant liver cirrhosis, significant pan or emphysema. And, and so just keep these uh, different genotypes in mind though on test day. And on liver biopsy, uh, I wanna go over one thing in particular here, and that is that this we can use a PAS diastase stain to detect alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So what did I just say? So PAS is our periodic acid shift stain. And all the PAS stain does, all I want you to know that it does, is it can detect complex tissues, uh, complex compounds within a cell. So it can detect polysaccharides, it can detect glycoproteins, it can detect glycolipids, and in this case, because uh, we're dealing with a misfolded alpha-1 antitrypsin protein that's being accumulated in our liver cells, we're gonna be able to, de to detect that glycoprotein. Now it doesn't end there. So the PAS stain, if it's positive, it doesn't tell us, hey, you have a glycoprotein. It'll just tell us you have something in your tissues. It could be a glycolipid, it could be a polysaccharide. So how do we differentiate this with other liver diseases. For example, you can have some liver diseases that have increased glycogen stores that can't get released from your liver. So how do we differentiate a glycogen from a glycoprotein? Well, that's where we have, oh, sorry about that. This is just simply stating what I just said. If you're PAS positive, you're gonna notice these purple, these something's gonna stain purple here, and that's all the glycoproteins. Now, going back to what I just said, how do we tell the difference between whether or not all of this uh, material that's lighting up on the biopsy, how do we tell that this is glycogen versus a glycoprotein? Well, the nice thing is not only do we have a PAS stain, we can also stain this with something called diastase. And diastase will break down that glycogen. And because alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, forms misfolded glycoproteins instead of glycogen, 
you'll still have that enzyme present. You'll still have that glycoprotein present after it, the uh, biopsy specimen was stained with diastase. So it'll be diastase resistant. And so just to sum that all up, if you have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency on biopsy, it's going to be PAS positive because you did find some sort of complex uh, compound within the tissues, in this case, glycoproteins, and it'll be diastase resistant because even if you pour a ton of diastase on the histology slide, you're not going to break down the glycoproteins. It would only break down glycogen that was present. And while we're here, let's just kind of uh, throw a call back to our small intestine lecture. I don't know if you remember, do you remember which small intestinal uh, infection yielded PAS positive organisms on intestinal biopsy? And so that was actually Whipple disease. And this is from our small intestine lecture. I just want you to remember that you can get PAS positive foamy macrophages in the lamina propria. And my mnemonic for that was this can of whip pass and that PAS was for, for this specific finding. And I'm actually just going to go back one second because I want to specify something. In the case of Whipple disease, remember how in Whipple we could not excrete a lot of our uh, lipids. They ended up getting trapped in there because our macrophages were compressing our lacteals and we couldn't excrete our lipids from our enterocytes into our thoracic duct. So what was happening there was we were actually getting excessive glycolipids in the case of Whipple disease. And that's why in Whipple disease, you'll get a PAS positive stain, not for any polysaccharide or glycoprotein, but because of this glycolipid. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more content.